How's it going? Yeah, not bad, mate. How are you? Yeah, I'm all right. Um, I mean, I'm going a bit mental, but yeah, I'm all right. <laughs> so, yeah. so what have we got here, then? So, yeah, I've got some fan letters here. You're a bit nervous, Tom. Or... Oh, is there actually anything about us? <laughs> <laughs> there, you get mentioned. There's nothing mental there. We'll start with a bloke called Mike, who's a Cribs fan. So this guy's... On Twitter, at Roving Artist, you can follow him and he's trying to... Um, That's a Cribs song, that, isn't it? Yeah, because he's trying to collect every um, ever Cribs release. It's quite <laughs> good. Like and He started doing Cribs quizzes every Saturday. So I'll listen to Mike's story about when he went to watch the Cribs in Leeds and I think Baby Shambles were playing at the same time. Hey, lads. It's uh, Mike from the... Roving Artist Twitter account. Uh, thought I'd submit a story from back in the day. So, 2006, uh, I think it was February, we got to see the Cribs in uh, Leeds at the refectory, Leeds Uni. Uh, this is two days, or maybe three days after Ryan's jumped on the table at the Enemy Awards. We've been in the pub and we're walking up. We see a big crowd of people near the Leeds Met. Uh, it turns out uh, Peter and Baby Shambles are playing Leeds Met on the same night. And it's fucking chaos. There's hundreds of people blocking the entrance room to get in. So the tour bus is just parked there. So we managed to wade his way through. It's calm. It's just security saying... Pete can't do the gig because he can't get off the bus. We managed to get through and we get up to see... The Cribs at Leeds. Uh, cribs come out. It's the usual chaos. There's pints flying everywhere. And Ryan, after his table dive a few days before, says, does anyone want to see my scars? He takes his shirt off and he's got this massive cut. And he says the doctor's told him to cancel the gig. But he says there's Cribs and they don't cancel the gigs. He says, don't worry about it. I'm all right, mate. The place just erupts as they start playing, I'm all right, me. He's got blood coming out of his stitches from those few days before. I don't know who does it. Then Ryan again says, normally I jump into the crowd at this point, but because of this cut, I'm not allowed. So that doesn't mean uh, that you guys can't jump this way and get on stage. Anyway, obviously, as soon as he says that, people are just bombing on stage. There's, there's equipment getting knocked over, ship owners going ape shit, security are going mental, and it's just a really fucking chaotic end to the gig, as they always were, obviously, back then. So the gig finishes and we start walking back into town, and it's still chaos at Leeds Met. This time, I don't know if the gig's happened or what, but everyone's rocking the tour bus. I think Peter's on it. The tour bus can't get out. There's hundreds of people there, there's police there, there's people chanting Peter's name. I think that just perfectly encapsulates the time, uh, especially in Leeds back then. I suppose you uh, remember, a gig, remember a night where they both played in Leeds, do you? Sounds like something you know. I don't know, but I definitely... Uh, one was, There was one night where... I got on stage with Shambles at Leeds Uni. It might have been that night. Oh, yeah, I went to that when you did Danny Jones. Yeah, you were there, weren't you? Yeah, me and me, Jack and James went to that, yeah. Was that, then, was that at the uni? Yeah, I think it was at the uni, one of the unis, definitely, yeah. Uh, that was, and that was 2006, I think, yeah. Could have been that night. So are you going to tell some of the stories that you've been emailed as well? Yes, yeah, so I'll do that now and then just get your reaction to them, if you have any. No pressure. <laughs> right, this one's from Alexander Edwards. I feel like I should do like a radio thing, like Chase for emailing in, yeah? <laughs> so this one's from Alexander Edwards. Thanks for email, Alexander. So he says, thanks for taking the time to read this. It's a long old block of text with me rambling. I've turned into that old guy who watched up about the past. Well, so have we, so it's fine. 
I could talk about this era in music forever. Uh, it was the most exciting time and almost certainly formed the person I've become today. There's people I made friends with via the Cribs Forum in 2005. I'm still in regular contact with today. We had Zoom meetups every three weeks through this year. I've been, I think between the Cribs Forum enemy and Dancing Jesus and now very much defunct online message board, I found most of the music I still love. Perhaps my overriding memory from 2005, I was 15 and becoming increasingly annoyed by the fact that a lot of new exciting bands were playing at 53 degrees in Preston, which was the nearest city I could realistically get to. And they were all 18 or over gigs. I can't remember why I thought this would work, but at school I decided to email a promoter for the venue. I explained the situation and mentioned in particular an upcoming We Are Scientists gig asking by if some miracle he allowed me in, despite being three years younger than the age limit. To my astonishment, he emailed me back. Obviously, the answer was no, but he told me to give him a ring on the day of the gig, and he tried and get me something signed, for the, something signed by the band. Absolute score, he says. Travelled to Preston on the day, and the guy, I honestly feel so bad that I can't remember his name in brackets, Went all out. He managed to meet me outside the venue, took me through the back corridors into the empty venue where the We Are Scientists were we checking. We checking? We're sound checking. They asked what song I wanted to hear. They played Great Escape, and then we sat and talked for half an hour. They signed a CD for me, and we had some photos. Absolutely unreal experience. But this, all, this but actually, this story itself does look, does get a little weirder. A short time later, I had tickets to the Enemy Awards in 2006. The lineup was one of and still is one of the best gigs I've been to. Mystery Jets, We Are Scientists at the Monkeys Maxima Park. By pure chance on the day, we'd been dropped in Manchester early. So we'd been, we were kind of hanging out at the academy. We bumped into all the bands who were playing there. And Keith remembered me from the 53 Degrees gig. Around a week later, I was in London with my family. I learned that the NME Awards were being held at Hammersmith Palace. Were you there at that one song? Uh, 2006. What year was that? We were hanging there just to see if we could see any bands arriving. Hanging out right outside, we saw a lot of people. And I still having a notebook I bought from nearby Tesco. Got autographs from Kaiser Chief, Block Party, The Strokes, Peter Hook, Pete Docker, Ian Brown, and others. And there's a weird moment as Kanye West left and everyone just froze. At one point, an ambulance pulled up and the paramedics ran inside. They returned carrying someone lying on their front. Peering through the front of the ambulance, I realised it was Ryan Jarman after his infamous jump across the table. I was absolutely baffled by it, especially as the Cribs were my favourite band. I gave him a wave. He gave a wave back and then gave me the Vs. Brackets in a friendly <laughs> <laughs> Bizarre. Uh, he writes. Wow. Shortly after this, a guy nearby approached me and said he'd been he'd seen me asking for photos and autographs and could tell I was a real fan, rather than a lot of people who were clearly e- eBayers with their glossy photos. He had two spare tickets to the awards and offered them to me like an absolute dream. I went in with my mum and had such an insane evening. So this guy's at the enemy awards with his mum. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. I love that. Um, uh, personal highlight was Sid dancing with Simon Pegg and Nick Frost. I told Simon Pegg I thought he was brilliant. He replied with "No, you're brilliant," which will make, which will remain a life highlight. <laughs> we are the We Are Scientist story. Then helped me to win a competition a couple of years later. Uh, when two thousand and when Absolute Radio in two thousand and nine after some good gig stories, they put my story on with a few others on their website and. The public voted, and using the sway of the Cribs Forum, I managed to win the competition, which was VIP tickets to Reading. But just going back well, to the Enemy Awards, because um, I asked him what it was like in there, whether he was sat at tables, but he said by the time he went in, it was just like <laughs> a normal, like a massive indie night, basically, with loads of fa- loads of famous indie people in there. Is that what happened? Yeah, I guess it does just turn into that. They clear all the tables up, and then everybody just gets... Waste is um, <laughs> in a massive venue as well. I don't know if we were at that. Oh yeah, we was we were we were at that one definitely because I I remember seeing him. I remember seeing Ryan fly across the table because they went up to get that award with the Kaiser Chiefs or whatever. 
Um, yeah. yeah, it's quite. It's a good. That's that's pretty good. I like the fact. You know, like I think, like around then was like, like the um, the difference between then and like the nineties with Britpop. I feel like the bands and the fans were like a lot more like. You know, you had a lot of more access, easy access to the bands and people. You know, it was just a lot more. What's the word? More of a community kind of thing. Yeah, you know, you could hang out with the bands more. And like yeah. even now, I think even now the um, it's it's like even more nowadays, isn't it? You know what I mean? Especially with, with like social media and stuff, you just got you're in touch with the artists more. Pete, Pete was like it a lot as well, and everyone was just like the, the fans are obviously like they they made everything anyway. So yeah, that seems to be like one of the main differences from like like you say the nineties is that um, everyone was encouraged to like uh, get on stage and stuff like that and go to these gigs at people's yeah. houses. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I guess what I mean I don't know if that happened. I suppose that must have happened in other areas like. Gorilla gigs and all that, but I guess that's what made it all exciting, I suppose. Yeah, there's just it's just a different relationship between the band and the artist. Yeah, so he's got VIP VIP tickets for Reading, and uh, he said one when they were watching Radiohead when they came on a go with a nearby big firm hammer, uh, everyone was hitting each other with it, and there was a guy wearing an army helmet and goggles, and he hit him over the head a few times. The girl nearby and then decided to inform him that it was actually Harry Potter, <laughs> and it turned out to be Daniel Radcliffe. So, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Frank Daniel Radcliffe told him that he sounded like Gary Barlow, and they were, apparently they were um, they watched the whole set together, and uh, yeah, <laughs> but yeah, he says uh, yeah, he like loves the cribs and all that, and he met his girlfriend in two thousand and nine because he was wearing a cribs t shirt. So there we go. Cheers, Alexander. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Uh, so this guy is called Bradley Jack, and he sent one in saying he's listened to the podcast and all that. And he said uh, when he was nineteen, he managed to be in a Croobs video for Leather Jacket Love Song as um, Gary Jarman's standing. I met up with the band and the rest of the crew. It was being directed by Andy Nels of Franz Ferdinand at Wakefield bus station at 9am. And then they headed off to the first location. He ended up shooting with the band all day. Had to wear Gary's old clothes from the 90s and play a neon green Warwick bass. He asked Gary if he could... I do. I remember that video. He asked Gary if he could lend a pick to play bass and he still got it. And you can actually see him playing on stage when the guys are looking down from the balcony at the end of the video. Uh, so he's got to hang around with the band all day at Audio Zone Rehearsal Studios and Osset Town Hall. They were all cool people and he ended up having a cigarette with Ryan at one point and talking about their other music videos. At the end of the day, they got 50 quid and had to sign an NDA to keep the video released quiet as it was being re- released the year after. There's a photo of the Jamans and us on Instagram on the day. It's very cool. <laughs> so... <laughs> It's very cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, did you have? Did you do videos where you had to get fans involved? Um, fifty-two pound like that. Yeah, fifty-two pounds a bit like that. We just ended. To, most of the people in that were just our mates, though. Joel's in that video. It was at a club, uh, a pub in East London somewhere. I can't actually remember where exactly now. And then uh, Welsh Pete. He was he was like a barman in the video, and he gets a bottle smashed over his head. If you watch it, quite funny. Do you go funny. through a window? At some point, it, or... Yeah, I had a, I had a stunt double, and he was he was Asian as well. Didn't look anything like me. Right. <laughs> Mental. Right. Yes, yeah, involves you guys. This one's this one's from James uh, Skeen. Sorry if I said that right. I thought I'd send you a couple of stories from back in the day. And he says, you like you love the Black Wire podcast and it's great to hear an interview from a leader with the band he loved, but nobody else at the time seemed to have heard of them. I first got into them when I went to see the Cribs at Stockton Georgian Theatre in 2005 and they were supported by the Paddingtons. Do you remember that song by any chance? God, yeah. I just don't remember a lot. I'd never heard of Black Wire, but I was a massive fan of the Cribs and I liked the Paddingtons too. 
absolutely loved the set and Dan was a great front man. The next day I bought their album and tried to go see them wherever I could, which reminds me of when I went to see them supporting CSS in Newcastle. Me and my mates had a few to drink and we're getting a bit excited dancing around at the front like proper fanboys. Next thing, I'm sure one of the band prompted us to get on stage where we continue to dance like tits and one of my mates knocked an amp over, <laughs> which caused the black white set to prematurely end. Me and my mates will talk about it to, to this day. You must have had stuff like that where things went wrong on stage because people were going mad. Yeah, you just have to kind of get on with it. Exactly. It's just like part of the buzz. It was always at the Quibs gigs when we were spotting the Quibs that they just they'd do it for us and then they'd do it for the Quibs as well. And they'd just be, they'd just be shit everywhere. <laughs> you can't find your guitar lead, like no microphones. Like, I'm sure shit, shit used to get Nick, like, people used to steal stuff as well. I'm, I'm sure, like, I had a couple of microphones, Nick, because someone had just run on stage and Nick, Nick and Mike. Yeah, I'm sure the Cribs had a thing a few years ago where someone stole Ross's snare drum, didn't they, or something? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, man. <clears throat> yeah, I remember when we went to watch Good Shoes in Leeds at Brew Donnell, and uh, <laughs> Jack, en- Jack ended up on stage and just completely cut out the sound. It was mental. <laughs> he just stood at the front with his like shrugging his shoulders, like what? <laughs> <laughs> Off his head. Yeah, and they were quite um sensible band, really, I think. So they didn't appreciate it. Yeah. Right, I got one from Dawn from Scotland. Me and the husband have traveled loads for gigs in the early noughties. Uh, worked for a PR company called Traffic. Ended up doing gigs for Kasabi and Data Pretty Things, etc. Best one for me, we travelled down to Oldham from Falkirk in Scotland to see Baby Shambles. I managed to get on the bus and it's the first time we'd met Pete. Had a chat with Pete and the band for a while, got to the hotel and the noisettes were walking in as well. Ended up back in their room partying. Have lots with the Paddingtons too. Top blokes. I remember those tours, that, that tour actually, with the noisettes. We uh, we played on some of those shows as well, like in Stoke, Stoke-on-Trent and that. I mean, I remember you saying you used to get on the David Shambles tour bus a lot. Was it a bit like a party bus on there? Yeah, I think I think they just had a better bus than us as well. So it was like I used to always end up on there, definitely. And it was yeah, you just you just end up aware of you travelling. You just party all the way there, I guess. That meet me in the bathroom book talks about a hotel in London where everyone used to stay. Oh uh, yeah, the Columbia. Was it? Yeah, that sounds mad. Yeah, we used, we used to stay there as well. It was like it was like a shit hotel, but it was like famous because everyone used to stay there, you know. Yeah. So and it was just you could kind of get away with get away with getting like having parties in your room or whatever. So I think that was obviously and and like you just meet other bands on tour, so it was just like you know that was kind of cool as well. Yeah. Is that where you end up having a chat with Julian or something? No, that was at um, that was at the Met, the Metropolitan, I think, the Met Club. Yeah, I ended up going out. For, I, I ended up going outside with him for a joint or something, and it was <laughs> like, I didn't, I don't smoke weed either. I fucking, I always, I always pull a white, but I just pretended that I smoked weed because he was like, you want to kind of it. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it was it was Ryan Gentle's birthday as well. I remember that night. Was well, that about two thousand and six or something? It was. That was right after um, we'd been on tour with the Bravery. Ah, they, right. were mate, they were mates with them because obviously they were from New York. Uh, yeah, so uh, I think yeah, it was probably also two thousand and six. It was like um, first impressions of Earth when that came out. All ah, right. So were they still boozing around then? Because I always assumed they stopped boozing around that point. But it must have been I after that. I think so, yeah. He, he, well, he was definitely smoking weed. Yeah. Fair play. I've got a last one from Brad Goddard, who says, Pete was at the peak of being in the paper every day with Kate and Baby Shambles, and they were booked to play the Homelands Festival in Winchester. Shambles were booked in the Saturday to play and they announced a warm-up gig the night before in Southampton, an event called the, a venue called The Joiners, 
which probably mm. holds around 100 people. Tickets obviously sold out in minutes and instantly were on eBay for stupid money. Not wanting to miss out, I said to two of my mates, we'll get down there, make it early and try and get in on the guest list. So armed with a couple of crates, we sat, we spent the day sitting outside the joiners, drinking all day and speaking to the support bands and any staff. Support bands and staff laughed at us saying they couldn't even get their girlfriends on the guest list. The day was getting on and the van pulled up and it was the band without Pete. And we went over and spoke to them and I laid it on thick to Adam, who said he might be able to, he might be back out in a couple of hours. A couple of hours passed and we gave up and went to get another crate. And as we turned up outside the venue, everyone was going inside. Adam decided to pop his head out and escort us over to the bouncers and get us in. The sound was shit. I couldn't hear a lyric out of Pete's mouth, but it's still the best gig I've ever been to, thanks to Adam. Nicest <laughs> guy in music. Met him a few times since pissed and probably annoyed him, but he's always up for a chat. Kick from Hall called Callum sent me loads of old enemies, and uh, one of them I was talking about a gig you played at in Preston, I think. And uh, it was like it was like a weird crossover period, wasn't there? Where did Pete start Baby Shambles while he was still in the Libertines or something? Yeah, it, it was when he burgled Carl's flat or something, and um, it must have been around that time, maybe. I don't know. I, yeah, I honestly just can't, I can't piece it all together properly ever. <laughs> just get it all mixed up. It says you guys supported Pete came out to play a horror show with you lot. Did that happen quite a lot? Yeah, yeah, we, yeah, we, I've done that. For, was this in Stoke? Might, yeah, that might be it, yeah. Yeah, I think this sounds like it was in Stoke on Trent. And then Pete comes on at some point and Carl comes on to play with him. Yeah. As Baby Carl's, Shambles. Uh, that's exactly it, because there's a picture of me, Pete and Carl. On, I'm singing with Pete and Carl. <laughs> All right. Uh, on, on, there's a picture of it. And if you go on the um, Sal Gig Junkie uh, on Instagram, she has there's pictures of it on there. And it's in, oh, it's, right. oh, what was the venue? I've forgotten what the venue was called now. The Underground, the Underground in stuff. Yeah. All right. And there's a pic, yeah, there's a picture of Carl and Pete, and then I'm I'm on stage for some fucking I don't know <laughs> I don't know why I'm there. <laughs> and then somewhat like afterwards. I think he got shut down or something. I don't know. And uh, everyone got kicked out and Pete and Carl ended up doing like separate gigs outside outside with an acoustic guitar. Yeah, that, that's when they like stood on top of a van or something, I think, playing to the streets. <laughs> <laughs> so to finish on, we've got a couple of recorded stories, one from William Han and another one from Ant Mead, who... Tells us what it was like being in and around the others back in the day and how they actually helped him from avoiding going to prison. So, but yeah, if you've uh, been inspired to tell us your story from back in the day, then do get them in to 22grandpod at gmail.com. And you can either send an email or you can record your story on, on a voice memo or something and uh, yeah, get them sent in. Good morning. Join me at a freezing cold park in northwest London. And it's got me thinking, like, back in the mid noughties it was never cold. Like, temperature was never a thing. I'd have lined a jacket. It was always T-shirt weather, cardigan weather at a push. And uh, that certainly isn't the case today. But I guess, like, my main overriding thing that I felt during the mid noughties is, like, a sense of, like, being at the centre of the universe like the cultural touch point of the planet it was just seems like the whole world was interested in what was going on in this little scene based in north london i remember being at like coco at times looking up at the balcony and seeing like eddie winehouse was there or uh the funny thing was like some of the arctic monkeys were at coco they had their own little private balcony the next morning there was in soccer am wearing the exact same with clothes they were wearing the night before <laughs> that's funny <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Ant. Back in the day, I used to go around as Millwall Ant. And here's a story I've not told in years, and it just exists in the world and comes back to haunt me occasionally. But it's the tale of how Dominic Masters from the others helped keep me out of prison. 
Um, before I start, though, I want to stress that whilst this is a story I can tell with a degree of confidence, it's not a story I'm particularly proud of. I was a bit of a twat back in the day, and this story is the peak of that twatty existence. Uh, in 2004 or so, I was travelling the country, following bands like the Libertines around, and doing a lot of drugs. And it was a lot of drugs. And to fund this lifestyle, I started dipping into the till at work. Um, I was working at Starbucks, I was a manager, and I had access to quite a bit of money. One day I heard that Pete Doherty was doing a last minute gig somewhere in East London. I was just finishing my shift, didn't have the cash to get there, and thought, well, I'll nick 50 quid from the till and figure out how to replace it a week later. I could always claim it had dropped down the back of the safe or something like that. Anyway, I went to the gig, had a great night. Uh, Pete obviously didn't show up because it was 2004 and... That's what happened on the internet a lot. We just used to gather and it was a lot of fun. Um, a week later, no one at work had noticed the 50 quid missing. So I did it again and again and again. And eventually I was dipping my hand into the till and pulling out wads of cash with seemingly no consequence. Now, I'll be real for a moment. I knew there would obviously be consequences. I knew at some point the shit would hit the fan. Um, what I probably didn't know at that point was that I had a fuck ton of undiagnosed mental health conditions. And... I wasn't thinking clearly, let's put it like that. Uh, I've had pretty severe obsessive compulsive disorder my whole life and at the moment I can't leave my house at all. Um, I have so many coping mechanisms that I use to fight the OCD like hand washing, checking locks, counting rituals etc. Um, what I found back then was that cocaine made those coping tools completely obsolete. Uh, so I didn't really care much about the risks I was taking. I was very depressed but I'd found something that gave me a bit of a reason for living and a drug that allowed me to actually do it. I'd been a teenager during Britpop and I was usually too scared to leave my bedroom to ever get to go to gigs so for me this was a real second chance to live within a music scene. Anyway this routine of nicking cash and going on week-long benders with bands carried on for a while. One day I turn up for work and see three police officers and someone from head office. Uh, the police later asked me why I didn't just run, and it's like, why would I? I knew I was obviously guilty. I just sat, drank a cup of tea while I waited for them to do whatever they were doing, and then asked me to join them. Uh, I was arrested, charged with theft. By the time the police were called, I'd stolen about 14 grand. Now, I knew I'd taken a lot, but I had no idea it was that much. Anyway, let me get this back on point. A few days after my arrest, Dom had put out a call for people to help with the video for their next single, William. I turned up somewhere in London, dressed up as a panda, had a great day um, and was just about to leave when Dominic pulled me to one side and asked me to come out the back of the pub with him. He'd heard about what was going on and wanted to help. They still had bits of the video to film and he kept getting shouted at to come back in and he'd flash a hand up to ask him to wait. He was currently phoning Alan McGee to see if he'd help. He also phoned Pete Doherty's manager based on the logic that he was keeping Pete out of prison a lot. But of course the reality to that is he was very busy keeping Pete out of prison a lot so didn't really have time to work on my case. Uh, the video shoot continued with occasional breaks for more thinking through the options and the day ended with Dom hooking me up with guest lists for their show at the NME Awards the following day where we'd talk about it more. The next day I went along, saw them perform, got introduced to the band's manager Matt, we chatted about what I'd done, I got asked if I actually did it and I was always really quick to say oh yeah I'm completely guilty. That was the base we're starting from. Um, we put a plan together. I'd get clean. Matt would write to the court saying I was working for the band and therefore gainfully employed. Um, and he helped me get some other letters of support that stressed how out of character it was for me, things like that. And so I became an unpaid employee of a band I absolutely love, The Others. What that meant most of the time is that I'd hang around, help with the guest list occasionally, sell some merch, and sadly continue with my drug habit every day. I repeat my earlier statement, I was a twat. Every gig that we went to, people would chant free Millwall Ant. Um, and I remember going to the Paradiso Club in Amsterdam where the others played, supporting the Kaiser Chiefs, the Cribs were out there. It was a real little, wonderful little tour. We all went out there for the day. And there were thousands of people in this crowd and Dutch people started singing it. And it was just so bizarre. And of course, like the slight idiot that I was at the time I was living this strange sort of dual life where I'd be some kind of anti-hero at gigs living the life of a rock star with absolutely zero musical ability um, then coming home and just crying and being unable to get bed, out of bed for three days my girlfriend at the time saw like both sides to this and I treated her abysmally she had to witness me showing off to a bunch of kids at gigs 
and then was there for me at my lowest, which was the entire rest of the time. But there were some amazing high points, you know, it was a, a lot of fun going to gigs, being recognised, being part of that inner circle. Um, the 853 was a wonderful thing. It got a lot of stick from a lot of people, but it really was very cool. The original people that formed it on the top of a bus, like, slightly distanced themselves over time because more and more people got involved. And I was always very lucky that those original 853 members always treated me very nicely. They were all very cool, cooler than I was, you know, and it was a really good group of people to hang around with. And then as more people came in, you then became the old guard and helped. We'd all obviously crowd surf during the others' gigs. And then it became a sort of duty by the time This Is For The Poor, the last song came on, that some of us would crowd surf first, then protect the drum kit from getting absolutely battered by everyone else making their way on for the stage invasion. Um, honestly, it's taken a hell of a long time for me to get past my own behaviour and how I was and how depressed I was and everything like that to be able to truly enjoy some of those amazing moments that were touring with that band. Um, eventually my court date came around and in massive part due to the work done by the band I got away with a fine just paying the money back that I'd stolen and a community service order. I walked out of the court and my lawyer said he'd never seen anyone steal that amount of money and not get a custodial sentence. Um, I stepped out of the courtroom, my phone lit up with texts from members of the 853, most of whom I'd never met, wishing me luck, congratulating me, that sort of thing. Um, I was on the first train up to London to see Dominic. I got high. Um, I demonstrated no personal growth at all. Uh, in later weeks, I did interviews with the enemy. There was a headline on the enemy, which band loved their fans so much they bailed one out of jail. That was good fun. Um, my little bit of notoriety and low-level indie fame continued just a little bit longer. I remember doing an interview with Spin magazine, and I'll never forget telling this American journalist the story with Dominic backstage and explaining how he's clean now and everything was rosy. The interview finishing and me just offering the guy a line. It really did take me a further three months of acting like an idiot before I was finally ready to sort of leave it all behind. Um, I left that whole scene, moved back in with my dad, cleaned up, got a job, turned my life around. I mean, I'm now very depressed all the time and I now can't leave my house ever. The perils of not ever finding a drug that worked quite like Coke did for treating my OCD despite years of therapy and psychiatric appointments. But... I have all these amazing memories and I have that amazing story to tell and whilst I'm definitely ashamed of elements of it it was an amazing thing to be a part of and yeah very lucky to be involved with it and the others the others the Paddingtons the Cribs bands like that all remain on my playlist constantly for like I just love that music I love that scene and it was magical and that's it, and it's just Ant now, it's not Millwall Ant, so I shall sign off, and thanks very much. Pod. Pod.